Hi there, everyone. So welcome back to another walkthrough for coordinated science uh, papers. We're going to go through the multiple choice paper from uh, October, November 2021. So this is the last paper uh, that was published with this. So this is the extended paper uh, for multiple choice. If you're doing the core paper, remember that's paper one. This is the extended paper. Make sure when you go into the exam, Make sure when you go into the exam that you are doing the right paper. Make sure you're either doing core or extended. Uh, you will be registered accordingly for that. Okay. So for this, you'll need a multiple choice answer sheet. That's a separate answer sheet. It's the one with those little circles on and you shade fully the correct answer. Okay. So you'll put all of your details on there and that's marked by a computer <clears throat> like that's scanned and marked automatically by the IGCSE. You'll need a soft clean eraser or rubber, and you'll need a pencil type B or type HB. And that, the idea is then is that if you make a mistake, you can erase the answer that you've shaded in. OK, so that's paper two. This is the same for uh, the core paper as well. The instructions are the same. Um, there are 40 questions on this paper. Answer all of the questions. Uh, for each question, there are four possible answers, A, B, C and D. Choose the one you consider correct and record your choice in soft pencil in soft paper in soft pencil on the multiple choice answer sheet follow the instructions on the multiple choice answer sheet write in soft pencil write your name center number candidate number on the multiple choice answer sheet on the spaces provided so you don't actually write it on this paper here see there's no space to write it uh, do not use correction fluid do not write any on any barcodes. You may use a calculator. Now, let's say, for example, you've gone A, B, C, and D like this in the multiple choice. The best thing to do is if you can clearly erase, if you can clearly erase your answer, then that is a very good idea. But let's say, for example, you erase it and you're not sure, just put a cross for it like so, and then mark your answer here like this if you decided you changed your mind, okay? Just put a cross for it there like that. Uh, you're allowed to use a calculator. Don't write in any barcodes. Uh, this paper isn't sent, I believe, to the IGCSE. You can scribble like answers and workings out and things like that on here, but it's not going to get marked. You don't get any marks for working out here. Okay. Total mark for this paper is 40, uh, and it's divided equally between biology, chemistry, and physics. So usually what happens is biology has 13 marks, chemistry has 14 marks, and uh, physics has 13 marks marks or questions. Each question is worth one mark. Uh, they rotate that every year, I think. So sometimes biology is the one that's got 14 marks and things like that. Uh, any rough working uh, should be done on the question paper. So here, and the periodic table is printed at the back. That's primarily for the chemistry questions, but if you get a nuclear physics question, always useful as well. Now, what they normally do is they do it by section. So if we scroll all the way down here, we can see here, the list shows some requirements of living things. So that's clearly biology. So if we scroll all the way down here, when we get to question 13, that will probably be the last biology question. So yep, still got question 12 is what is an ecosystem? So all of these questions are biology questions. Here we've got question 13 about the carbon cycle. Again, biology. Now we've got physical and chemical changes. So now we're at chemistry. So most likely in the mid twenties, so around 26, 27, we'll start getting the physics questions. So if we go here, why does steel used? Yep, manganese. We've got zinc. We've got uh, exhaust emissions from a catalytic converter. So yep, we're still in the uh, chemistry section. We've got ethanol structures. We've got uh, chemistry decay equation. Ah, here we go. So we've got extension of a spring problem. So the paper, you see you've got 40 marks and the paper is 45 minutes long. So that means that you have about a minute per question to answer it. So there's not a lot of in-depth things. Now, obviously, this, don't, this isn't a hard and fast rule. Obviously, some questions may just take a few seconds and some might take a little bit longer. If you are stuck on a question, though, and it's been over a minute or two, move on to the next question. Remember, you don't have to answer these questions in order. The only thing you do need to be aware of is that obviously you're going to be transferring your answers to that answer sheet that you're going to shade in. Make sure you're very careful when you're transferring the answers when you shade them in, okay? Because it's very easy, particularly under the pressure of an exam, to accidentally shade the wrong row, especially 
if you're doing the questions out of order. So just be very careful with that. Right, so we're gonna have 13 questions, 28 to 40, and they go pretty much in order of the syllabus. So you will probably start with a mechanics question like this. We'll probably finish up on a, on a nuclear physics question. So a student is investigating the extension of a spring. The diagram shows the spring before and after 0 0.20 Newton's load is added. So before and after. What is the spring constant of the spring? Oof, okay, so we know that F equals Kx, where X is extension. So F over X equals K. So first off, we know that force is 0 0.20 Newtons. And we're gonna look at the extension here. So we're at two centimeters here, and it's increased to what looks like, I'm gonna to have to zoom in for this, what looks like 0. Point, oh sorry, 2.8 centimeters there. So 2.8 centimeters. So the extension is 2.8 minus two, 0 0.80, uh, oops, 0 0.8 centimeters, like so. Okay, so it's 0 0.20 divided by 0 0.80 centimeters. Now you can use a calculator for this, but if I did some simplification there, that looks like a quarter. I am going to check though, because I've got the time. Give me rolling over to get my calculator. You are allowed to use a calculator. So I would double check if you're not sure. And yeah, it's one quarter, so that's 0 0.25 newtons per centimeter. Always have a check as well. The units are correct, so that's 0 0.25 newtons per centimeter. I'm going to check the units are correct on all of them, and the answer is C. Okay, so double check the units. Sometimes you might get the same answer, but the units are around the wrong way. So that was the first question. Second question, or sorry, 20, question 29. Table gives, uh, the table gives the weight and the total area of contact with the ground of four animals. Which animal exerts the least pressure on the ground? So we're trying to find the smallest pressure. So we're trying to find smallest pressure. And we know pressure equals force divided by area. So we know the area and we know the force in this case is weight because weight is a type of force. So I'm gonna just do for each of these, I'm just gonna do, I'm gonna work out the pressure of them. So in this case, it is pressure equals 270 divided by 220. So I'll just do, I'll just do it in my calculator, 270 divided by 220. And I'm just gonna round, so that's 1.23. Now to make things not complicated here, I'm just gonna do each of these on my calculator so you don't see the working out so it doesn't clutter it. So, but I'm gonna do the same thing again. In this case, it's 41 divided by 29 for the cat. The cat has a pressure of 1.41 newtons per cubic, uh, sorry, per square centimeter. For the duck, I can see the duck is probably going to be smaller because it's a fraction. So it's 16 divided by 72. And that gives me 0 0.22 newtons per cubic. Uh, sorry, per square centimeter. And then for the mouse, I'm going to do 0.19 divided by 0.12. And that is 1.58 newtons per square centimeter. So it says here, which is the smallest? Well, it's the duck. If you were good at maths, you could probably do that in your head by realizing that all the others would give you a, a number bigger than one. And this is essentially a fraction. So it's gonna be a number smaller than one. And that's the only one that does that. So it's the duck. A ball, let's do question 30. So a ball falls vertically downwards. Which energy transfer takes place as the ball accelerates downwards? So we've got our ball here at a certain height, h, 
and it is falling in this direction with an acceleration. At this point here, it's high up. Before it starts falling, it only has gravitational potential energy. As it is falling, that gravitational potential energy is being converted into kinetic energy. And when it hits the ground, all of that gravitational potential energy has become kinetic energy. So as it accelerates downwards, it's not elastic strain. Gravitational potential energy sounds right. Gravitational potential to kinetic sounds right. Elastic is wrong. To kinetic is correct. Kinetic is the wrong way around. So the only answer is A, a gravitational potential to elastic. Both of those have to be right for the mark or for the to get the correct answer. Okay, so for question 31, at 250 watt electric motor lifts a load through a height of four meters, uh, sorry, lifts a 50 Newton load through a height of four meters in three seconds. What is the efficiency? Okay, so first off, we've got to work out the power needed. Now the power is energy divided by time. The energy needed to lift it is mass times gravity times height. Uh, 50 Newtons, that's the weight, that's actually mass times gravity there. So the energy needed to lift it is 50 times four. So the energy needed to lift it is 200 joules. The power is 200 joules divided by the time it took to do that, three. So power 200 divided by three, it's three seconds yet. So it's 66.7 watts, okay? So that's the power needed to lift it all up. But we can see the electric motor uses 250 watts. So 66.7 watts, of that 250 watts has gone to what we want it to do, okay? Has gone to what we want it to do. So that's the useful power. Um, the other, the rest of it is wasted. So I'm gonna just make a note that useful power is 66.7 watts. I'm gonna erase everything else. So scroll back if you want to go through all of this. I'm gonna erase all of this just so we have a little bit of space to work for calculating the efficiency. So, so sorry, that door's, door behind me is rattling. So efficiency equals useful power over total power and then we're gonna times it by 100 as a percentage. So the efficiency is going to be 66.7 over 250. So that gives me 0 0.266. To get it as a percentage, I times it by 100. So 0 0.266 is 26.6%, which rounds up to 27% to two significant figures there, okay? Okay, so that's that question. Which labeled arrow, for question 32, let's go on to this now. Which labeled arrow on the diagram represents condensation? Well, condensation, that is when, so think of it like if you're in the shower or something like that, when you get, uh, the uh, water vapor condensing onto the glass uh, glass shower door, or like on a very cold day, if you go in a car and there's like condensation on the side of the car, what's happening is you've got a gas, so you've got water vapor becoming a liquid. So the only possible option for that is A, not B. B is the other way around. B is either, if we're liquid to a gas, is either evaporation or boiling. So you can see, for example, that that question took me 10 seconds. The one above it took it a little bit more time. So that's what I mean by uh, result, um, questions don't always have to take exactly one minute. I knew I was probably gonna take a little bit more time on a calculation question, 
but it will be made up for with having a question where it's basically a, a definition question. Okay, so a sealed cylinder contains a uh, gas. The average speed of the molecules of the gas increases, but the average distance between them remains the same. How does this affect the gas and its volume? So average speed of the molecules of the gas increases, but the average distance between them remains the same. So basically what we've got is we've got a container here like this. If we've got a container, we've got particles moving at different speeds in random directions. And the pressure comes from those particles colliding with the wall of the, or how often the particles collide with the size of the container. So if they're moving faster, that equals more collisions. Because the particles are moving faster, that means they're gonna bounce off the wall or they're gonna hit the wall more often because they're moving faster. So that means the pressure is going to increase. So it can only be one of these two. So I'll cross those two out. So now it's either gonna be C or D. Now the distance between the molecules remains the same, or the distance between the average distance between the molecules remains the same. If the container was going to expand, so if the volume of the container was going to increase, that would mean that the distance between the, or the average distance between the molecules would also increase. But we're told it stays the same. So the volume has not increased because the average distance between the molecules remains the same. So there is no change. So the only option has got to be question uh, answer D, okay? Right, so here's another definition question. Four loudspeakers vibrate at different frequencies. Which frequency produces sound with the largest wavelength? So largest wavelength and can be heard by a human. So human hearing range is 20 Hertz to 20,000 Hertz. So we, can we can't hear that one. We can hear that one. We can hear that one. We can't hear 25 Hertz. Remember, 20 a kilohertz equals 1,000 Hertz. So what we're saying there is 150 Hertz, 2.5 kilohertz, that's 2,500 Hertz. 25 kilohertz is 25,000 Hertz. And then it says, which frequency produces sound with the largest wavelength? Okay, well, as frequency decreases, wavelength is getting bigger. So the largest wavelength has got to be the smallest frequency. Oh, sorry, the largest wavelength has got to be the smallest frequency. As frequency gets bigger, we can see that the wavelength gets smaller. So the answer is produces sound with the largest wavelength, it's gonna be 150 Hertz. That means it's gonna have a low pitch. Something with a higher frequency has a higher pitch, okay? Okay, so the diagram shows a ray of light striking a plane of mirror. So we've got our ray of light going in there like that. Remember, the angle of incidence is this angle here between this thing here, the normal and the ray. That's our angle, okay? So that's our angle there. And we also know that this is 90 degrees. So I know that the angle of incidence is going to be 90 degrees minus 20 degrees, so it's going to be 70 degrees. For reflection, angle, angle of incidence, I equals angle of reflection. So the angle of reflection, if you ever draw this, you would use a ruler. This is also got to be 70 degrees. So our answer is C. Be careful with that because you can also see that 20 degrees is put here and that is wrong. That's put there on purpose because you might rush into it and think, oh, it's 20 degrees. You need to take a step back, make sure you realize, ah, okay, I'm given this angle here, but that's not the angle of incidence. Here's how I calculate the angle of incidence, okay? Right, we've got five more questions. Which diagram shows a converging lens forming a real image of an object at O? Well, first off, a real image, image is on the other side of the lens to the object. The rays of light, this is uh, so the object. 
right, just give me a second. I just need to pause that for a second. So, so yeah, sorry about that. So what we'll so we'll go through this question again. So which diagram shows a converging lens forming a real image object O? So this is the object. Uh, the ray of, rays of light here don't converge, so that's not correct. Uh, this is not a ray diagram at all for a converging lens. That's just wrong. So <laughs> the light won't reflect like that, so it can't be that. Same for this here. It shouldn't be diverging away like that. That's completely wrong. So what we've got here is a ray of light. It's a little bit of a weird ray diagram. We've got our object here. Rays of light are going off from the object at different points here like this. They go through the lens and they refract, they converge around the focal point here. So the answer has got to be this one. Essentially, in this case, just look for the one where the light converges together. All of the other ones are incorrect. Um, a bit of a weird question, but there we go. OK, so for question 37, uh, formal left, the diagram represents waves in air. Molecules are closer together in region P than they are in region Q. So what we have here is a, a longitudinal wave. Uh, because the other option would be transverse. Transverse waves are the ones that where the oscillations are parallel to the direction of vibration. So we've got the, it's got to be a longitudinal wave. So it's either those two. And in a longitudinal wave, the oscillations are parallel to the direction of motion. So the wave direction, the direction of motion is this way. These molecules are going to vibrate backwards and forwards this way. So it is answer A. Right, so three more questions left. Okay, so this looks like a static electricity question. Question 38, a rod is rubbed with a dry piece of cough. The scientist holds the rod in her hand and brings it close to a negatively charged plastic strip. The strip is suspended by an insulating thread. The rod, as the rod approaches the strip, the strip moves towards the rod. Okay, so the strip moves towards the rod, and we can see that the plastic strip has a negative charge. So if it's moving towards the rod, we have got to have a positive charge along here. So the rod is not negatively charged. So it can't be those two. The rod is positively charged and we can only charge electrical insulators. So it is not a conductor. We charge a rod, we charge an insulator. So it's question D. Right, two more, last one. Diagram shows a wire carrying an electric current in the region shown. So we've got an electric current going through here, the wire, the wire is at right angles to a magnetic field that is directed into the page. And we can tell that all of this here, this region is a magnetic field um, by these crosses here. That cross means into the page. If you have a load of dots with a circle, that means out of the page, okay? The way I remember it is think of a dart or a bow, an arrow, a bow or something. If, some, if a bow is coming towards you, Oh, sorry, an arrow is coming towards you, you would see the point first, so you'd see the dot first. If the arrow is going away from you, you'd see the feathers, the flights first, like the cross there, like that, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use Fleming's left-hand rule because we're gonna try and find which uh, force acts on the wire, in which label direction does the force act. So I'm gonna do a really terrible drawing of a hand. There we go. This is why I haven't done an art GCSE. So this is my thumb here. That is my thumb. That's a bit better. So that's my thumb here like this going up. This is my index finger. And this is my center finger. Okay, the thumb represents the force or the motion and the index finger, that represents the magnetic field. Or sometimes you might say first finger field and the center finger that represents current. So what I'm gonna do is I turn my camera on. So in this case, thumb 
represents the direction of the wire. Index finger, index finger represents the, or the first finger represents the magnetic field. So in this case, the index finger is going into the screen, into the page. And my center finger represents the current. Now the current is going down this way. The current is going down, whoops. So current is going down. Magnetic field is going into the page. So the wire is going to move this way. Now my image is mirrored, so that's not very helpful, but my wire, if you followed along with me, if you use your left hand, is going to move in the direction of B. So that is Fleming's left hand rule. Okay, let me turn my camera off because I'm camera shy. And let's do question 30, 40. Last question, always check the last page as well. There's 40 questions, don't miss it, okay? Table gives information about the deflection and radiation in an electric field of a magnetic field. Okay, so we've got alpha and gamma, okay? So this is an alpha, beta, and gamma question there. So this is a definition thing that we need to know. I know alpha particles, alpha particles are two protons and two neutrons. So yes, they have a charge. So yes, they will be deflected in electric field. And yes, they will be deflected in a magnetic field. Anything with charge is deflected in both. So that is incorrect and that is incorrect. Now beta, we're not told that, but that's an electron. And a gamma particle is an electromagnetic wave. So an electromagnetic wave has no charge. So if it has no charge, it will be, it should not be deflected in an electric field. And this question is, there's an error in this question, okay? They are not deflected in an electric field. So I think this is actually an error in this typo. Gamma waves are not deflected in, oh, whoops, sorry, I made a silly mistake here. Which question is correct? I'm a silly person. So. I actually did the classic thing of not actually reading the question properly. So I make these mistakes so you don't have to. So let's find the things that are correct here. So which row is correct? Alpha deflects an electric field, deflects in a magnetic field. So A should be the correct answer, but let's check. This is incorrect. That's incorrect. This is correct. Oh, sorry, this is incorrect. That's correct. This is incorrect. This is incorrect. So the only one with both questions is alpha, okay? So make sure you read through the question there properly. Even I made that silly mistake there. Okay, right, thanks for listening. I will do another multiple choice paper if you'd like. Uh, please give me some feedback for if you find this useful or helpful. And I will do as well a paper four question, uh, paper four questions as well for coordinator science. Right, everyone, uh, take care.